Hello students. Um, continuing here with our discussion from in class about Little Women. Um, not going to do like a lot of uh, close readings or anything like that. What we're going to really do is focus in on a big, big issue that I think that the novel brings up. Brings up a lot of issues, I know, uh, but the one big issue that probably is of most importance to us in this day and age is what Louisa May Alcott's novel might have to say about the um, the institution of marriage at her time. Well, and I guess at any time. Um, and, and, and intricately mixed in with this is some of the stuff that we were bringing up last time about social class. Um, one of the first things to point out, and we'll, I'll make some references to some particular uh, events within the novel throughout this uh, uh, presentation. The, the upward mobility for women, remember we talked a, bit, a little bit about that social mobility, upward mobility, was almost entirely dependent upon marriage arrangements. We were talking in class about the fact that in the United States, particularly, part of our culture is this idea that, you know, anybody can be anything that they want to be and anybody can go any far as far as they their talents will take them and that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, that may be a somewhat simplistic view and it doesn't apply to everyone. There are a lot of people who haven't been allowed to do that. And guess what? In the 19th century, that was women uh, to, to a large extent, that their upward mobility was almost entirely dependent upon marriage arrangements. Not not in, not always, but but to a very, very large extent, your lifestyle, your your affluence or your poverty was going to depend almost entirely on who you married because that man was going to be the economic provider. And even if you found someone who was able to provide for you materially, if that person was not there for you emotionally or was not compatible with you intellectually or maybe had a lot of problems, uh, alcoholism, alcoholism uh, emotional, mental problems, those kinds of things. It was very, very difficult, if not impossible, for you to get out of that marriage. Um, everybody talks about the fact that today marriages, 50% of marriages end in divorce, and that's a very sad statistic. But, um, you know, it was an equally sad thing that in the 19th century, people could not get divorced, who probably should have been, or probably should never have married, frankly. But, um, uh, but by becoming a career woman in this sense, and you remember that in the novel, Joe um, gets a chance to sell her 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 stories at first, and then uh, you know more and more material gets sold, and she begins writing all this fantastical stuff and all these you know uh, you know over the top kinds of fiction that um, you know uh, deal with either scandal or you know. Um, the, uh, the 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 adventure sorts of stories that are kind of uh, and and when she finally sits down with Professor Bear and he reads her material he doesn't he doesn't think very much of it she has a she has a moment if you think about it she has a moment with Professor Bear there um, where he's telling her the truth just as Lori was telling Meg the truth when it came to whether she looked good being all dressed up and dolled up. Now, neither of the girls liked this, right? But it was still true that what they were doing was not their full potential. It was not the real them. It was not something that would be a meaningful, lasting sort of thing for, for either one of them. And they need to be hearing that. Um, not just from a man, but they, every one of us needs to have that kind of voice of truth, to be perfectly honest. Sometimes it's a sibling, I guess. Sometimes it's a parent. Sometimes it's just a best friend who says, when you ask, does this make my butt look big? They have to answer, well, yeah, it kind of does. Um, you, you shouldn't wear that <laughs> because your butt will look really big in that. Um, truth telling, very important. And sometimes that can come from a very close friend. Sometimes it comes from, um, you know, a life partner. And so when she decides to become someone who has a career, something that was not very common for women at the, at the time. Um, it, this, she's defying the established convention that the way as a woman, the way you get ahead in life is to, you marry well. Um, instead, she says, I'm going to take my own destiny in my own hands. And um, now doing that means you have to actually listen to people who can give you good advice, right? Because if you want to get ahead, and everybody knows this in a career situation, if you want to get ahead with a career, you have to have some mentors. You have to have some people to help you. You have to have people who are going to be really, really honest with you. Oh, I'm starting this company where I'm baking cookies and I love these cookies. And um, what do you think? Uh, they're gross. Sorry, but your cookies are crappy. Uh, people need to tell you this if you want to... Uh, uh, go into a particular line of work. So, you know, there are all the, th the good things and the bad things that Joe is going to encounter about being a career person. There is also a tension here 
um, with many of the characters, several of the characters, not just Joe, but not just Meg and Amy and, and, and whatnot. But the question is whether the marriage situations that emerge or an individual person's marriage bond with another person, is this going to destroy the sibling bond? Is it going to, so for example, when Amy uh, nearly dies, um, when Beth does die, um, when Meg gets married, we see that in part two, when Meg gets married to Mr. Brooke, um, and when, when Marmy has to go and take care of the father, um, uh, it, it, all these things are examples of the tension that the novel has within it of, look, you're born into a family. What happens to that family when the people in the family, the, the children in the family, grow up and form other bonds? Does it mean that the bonds that you had originally as a child with your nuclear family are destroyed? Does it mean, is it a threat to them? Um, or is it additive? Well, I mean, the obvious answer is it's additive, right, under ideal circumstances. Um, but it won't be the same. It won't ever be the same. And you have to get used to that sense of loss. And there is a sense of loss in the novel. They lose what they once had as sisters when they were little girls. They're not going to be the Pickwick Club anymore. They're not going to play like they did. They're not going to share like they did. Because that's a, that, that's a period in your life, and then you move on to other things. So there is a loss there to some extent. And it's to be, you know, regretted. But... Under the ideal circumstances, there is something that is added to that. So, so you know, when people say, well, Alcott never married, and Alcott had a very strong proclivity towards being a career woman and taking charge of her and not being defined by a relationship with a man, ergo, therefore, she was anti-marriage. Is, there is no evidence of that whatsoever. And, and just because Joe, early on, says, well, I don't want to get married or I want to be independent or I don't, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I'm, I'm closer to my, 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 my siblings than I ever will be to a husband. Don't read into that and say that Alcott herself was anti-marriage. She was not anti-marriage. What she was, was I think a lot like Margaret Fuller saying marriage as it was practiced during her day and age was really problematic for women. And things needed to change. And thankfully, I think a lot of, uh, to a large extent, they did change. And I think Alcott would look back today, uh, if she were alive today, and say things are much better for women than they were during her time. And that's a good thing. But I don't think I would read into that and say, no, 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 just because she was a lifelong bachelorette or whatever people use today that's politically correct to say, um, lifelong single person, single woman, doesn't mean that she was opposed to marriage. In fact, I think what she's trying to do here, and remember the audience, remember the audience and how important this is. These are young. She knows she's writing to girls. She knows she's writing to adolescents. She knows that she's going to write for, for, for young women who she, I think, hopes will have a different set of choices in their lives than their mothers or grandmothers did. And so she's sort of putting it in their head that there are different kinds of grown-up relationships that you can have. And not everything in life is about getting married. And, and sometimes it's not better to get married bad than not at all. Sometimes it's better not to get married at all if your choice is to get into a bad marriage. Sometimes it is better that, the, the, and, and, but she never said, she, the, the sisters are still close throughout their lives no matter what. And, and so the answer to the question, does she think that marriage destroys sibling bonds? Well, yes and no. Um, to some extent, yes. To, 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 in a deeper sense, no. Um, what we're shown in the novel is that marriage can potentially retard the personal, spiritual, and intellectual growth of women. And I think what Alcott is trying to do is to provide us with kind of a roadmap of how to avoid that, keep that from happening. You know, what is it, what are the necessary essentials to a marriage that ensure that both husband and wife are able to reach their full potential? Because I think she looked around and said, I don't think that that's happening in, in the world with a lot of people that I know. And I want that to happen for everyone, particularly girls who are reading this novel. I want them to aspire to the kind of relationship that's better than just having to settle for you know, an economic relationship um, to some extent. Now, and that brings us up with Joe's marriage to Professor Bear. Um, so many people have had a problem with this. Of course, everybody wanted Joe to marry Lori, and then a whole bunch of people don't want Joe to marry at all. 
and you know, although you, it's clear you can see it coming that they're developing a relationship, and it's a bit of a touching relationship. I, I actually think that that a lot of the people who are who slam this novel because they don't want her to marry Professor Bear, they want her to marry Laurie, or they don't want her to marry at all. I think they come down hard on this, and they think that it is um, a very problematic relationship. But in fact, it actually is a very logical relationship in some senses. They are suitable. They're compatible. They're well-suited for each other in some respects, not in all respects. He's very different from her in personality, isn't he? Um, he's um, quite a, 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 well, he's kind of a, a, a an introvert. She's not. Um, he is more methodical and even-headed and even-keeled and mild. She's not. Uh, he is very cerebral. She can be somewhat more guided by the heart and uh, by her strong, strong opinions and feelings. And he's a little bit more coolly rational. So he needs some of what she has. She needs some of what he has. So do you see, if you look at it in that light, it's not forced. Because a lot of people have criticized the novel and said, well, she feels like she, you know, she copped out. She sold out because in the end, you know, Joe's headed towards a life of, of, of single career woman. And then all of a sudden this Professor Bear comes along and she feels, uh, Louisa May Alcott felt pressured to make sure her heroine marries. And so she caves. I don't think that, but maybe to some extent. Um, maybe she decides I'm going down one direction with this character and I do want to take a little bit of a left turn and uh, guide her back another way because after all I have to remember my audience. These are young women who probably are girls that are one day will marry and so um, if I'm going to have a character that they identify with and that they like a lot, should I keep her single or should I show them through her how a person ought to marry? Um, I don't know. I mean, it's, 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 you know, you, you read the novel, you tell me. Okay. And then we, we've got Amy and how about Amy, a very artistically sensitive person, but, um, what does her experience traveling in Europe demonstrate? How does she change for the better? I mean, there's growth there. There's intellectual growth. There's obviously artistic growth. She becomes someone who is exposed to things that you wouldn't be exposed to if you were living in kind of a tiny little town in New England in the 19th century. But she's able to see some things and experience some things. It, it goes to her head a little bit after a, after a while, and her different encounters with Lori when he sees her over there kind of um, uh, makes it clear that she's gotten a little bit I don't know, a little bit ahead of herself in some regards. They certainly, obviously, in their many encounters, uh, tussle a bit, but what eventually emerges is a much closer relationship. Um, you know, he thought, of course, he was in love with Joe and wanted Joe to be his wife. Joe was going to have none of it. And, of course, if you've ever had that situation where you know that somebody has you know, romantic feelings for you, but you don't see them that way. That's a really hard thing to handle, isn't it? And Joe's trying her best to say, this isn't going to happen. But also, she sees him as a brother and doesn't want to hurt him. Of course, he goes and sulks, um, and he's going to do that, and he's going to, like, not talk to her for a while. All is mended in the end, of course. It's a happy ending novel, and to that extent, you might say, well, that's a little bit poor. But it is adolescent fiction. I mean, if they all died in a boating accident, for goodness sake, um, I, I dare say it probably wouldn't have made a very big impact on on uh, readers because their mothers wouldn't have let them read uh, the novel. That was kind of a horrible ending there. So it's going to have a happy ending, and it's going to. So the question is, if you're if you're sort of guiding the ship of this novel, you're the writer, and you're kind of putting forward the characters and their encounters and things. The question question that you have to ask yourself is, at a certain point, you wake up in the middle of it and say, hey, you know what? I'm in charge of this ship, and all these readers are following along with my storytelling here. What do I want to do with these readers? Where do I want to take them? What do I want them to see, to think, to feel? How do I want them to perceive these characters? And how do I, knowing that they, they, they sometimes will see themselves through the lives of these characters, what's, what, what do I want to do with them? And that's an important thing. Um, uh, if I can skip on to the next slide here, um, if I can. Yeah, there we go. Um, so the, the central question that I want us to focus on in our discussion online is just this one. It's going to be the only discussion question. I was, I'm interested in seeing what your, your thoughts on, on this. I think one of the central questions, if not the central question of the novel, is how does one live a happy and fulfilling life within the arbitrary confines of social customs and norms, especially gender 
customs and norms. We, we live in a world where there are boundaries and limitations on all of us in terms of our behavior, unless you're a Kardashian, in terms of our behavior, in terms of what people expect, how people see us. And you may be a very independent person, but it's really hard in this world not to want to try to live up to the expectations uh, or to be seen as positively in the eyes of other people. Maybe it's your parents, maybe it's your family, maybe it's your friends. I don't know, but nobody is immune to the kinds of pressures that one feels, um, or not very many people anyway. Um, and so we live in a world where there are expectations about us, about our behavior, about how we dress and how we look and how we act and what kind of relationships we should have. Um, and frequently it does come from family. So the question I think that the novel kind of poses is, all right, we live in a world like that. And sometimes you may live in a world where the social no norms and customs aren't very comfortable for you. You don't like them. A lot of people do, right? I mean, we can look back at Susanna Rosen's Charlotte Temple. And, um, you know, uh, th there, there, there are characters in there who are perfectly comfortable with the rules and regulations that society has in terms of defining who's being naughty and who's being nice, right? I mean perfectly comfortable with those things. There are others who don't like them. Uh, some of those people who don't like them are, you know, admirable and some of them are not admirable. So we all live in those, in the, in, within that kind of a society. The question is, how do we navigate our lives and find happiness and fulfillment while trying to find this wonderful balance between being myself and knowing what I stand for and knowing what I believe and knowing how I want to live and also, not being constantly, you know, bothered by the fact that other people don't perceive me properly or don't perceive me the way I should be. And so with gender, okay, um, you know, um, remember even Anne Bradstreet had to deal with this. In, in her poem, she says there are, you know, uh, you know, there are lots of carping tongued women out there who says my hand a needle better fits. Well, that's exactly what she's talking about. The people who say, you shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't be writing this. You should be doing this. You should be living this way. You should be getting married. You should be having children, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the question that, that follows from that is, do you think that Joe found a happy middle ground? I know a lot of people who don't believe so, and I think they have great arguments that, you know, it 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 just, the, the whole Professor Bear thing just isn't. It's a little too tidy and neat. Um she she really is logically the kind of person who wouldn't be a marrying kind um that it is a bit forced um i just don't seem to think i just don't think that it's as forced as people think it is i don't think it just came out of the blue i mean she prepares us for it and there's some sort of rationale or thinking behind it but there's still a great argument to be made that joe shouldn't have gotten married um another question that you might say follows from the central question of the novel is how do we and the readers of the time feel about the Amy Laurie match? In many ways it's appropriate. Will she be fulfilled? Um, in many ways it is appropriate. In many ways it seems a little out of the blue. Did Alcott have Laurie and Amy get together because otherwise the rest of their lives would be largely Loriless, if you want to put it that way. I mean, he's not going to reconnect with them on the same level unless there's a tie into the family somehow. So we got to get Lori married to somebody. And I understand her saying to herself, I'm not going to give these 11 year old, 12 year old readers the happy bow on the package. Uh, Joe and Lori get married kind of thing. I'm going to throw them a little bit of a curveball here because I want them to see that life's more complicated than that. But at the end, she pulls back and says, yeah, but, you know, I like Lori enough and, that I want him to stay in the lives of these characters. And there's only one way that that's going to happen. That's through the marriage bond. Will, will Amy be fulfilled? That's another question. Will Amy be fulfilled in a marriage to someone like Lori? Um, it's a little, am I, am I too picky when I say it's a little creepy that you know, he never really thought of her as, in a romantic way because she was too young, too little. And then somehow another later on, he discovers, wow, she's 
hot or whatever. Um, yeah, okay, maybe. I mean, I guess I guess people do that. Um, maybe I'm too old. Um, but it, it it is a little weird that that a character at one point was too old for a girl, and then suddenly they're not too old for each other. I don't know. You decide that. Um, it just kind of gives me the willies in a way. Um, one of these great quotes that Alcott gives us here at the bottom. I like to help women help themselves, as that is, in my opinion, the best way to settle the woman question. One of the big things that people talked about in the 19th century was the woman question. Of course, the woman question is, what roles should women have? The big, scary, hairy thing that people were worried about is that if you allow women to go into careers, none of them will get married, none of them will have children, they'll all just go out and smoke cigars and wear flannel shirts, and, 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 and then the, the human race will just simply stop. Um, which, looking back at some of that, really strikes you as being kind of funny, because... No woman who was arguing for women's rights at the time said, I'm doing this because I, I don't want to have a marriage or a family or anything like that. They weren't thinking, I'm going to do this or that. They were thinking, I would like to have a little bit of and, uh, or at least options and choices. And so one of the things she says uh, in this quote is, whatever we can do and do well, we have a right to. And I don't think anyone will deny us, which is a rather confident statement there. We meaning women. Whatever we can do and do well, we have a right to do that. Margaret Fuller argued that. Of course, she knew Margaret Fuller very well. And they all were uh, um, um, very much on the same page with regard to allowing women to do what women were talented enough to do. If a woman is able to be an engineer, if a woman is able to be um, you know, a, a banker or a, or a physician, then they should be allowed to do that. If they have that aptitude, if they have that talent, they should be allowed to do that. And of course, here we're talking about, you know, in the United States, this ever evolving question of, you know, e you know, equality and rights and who is allowed to be considered uh, a full member and participating member of the society. We know that that was not the case with people of, you know, uh, based on uh, racial exclusion, religious exclusion, gender, um, sexual orientation, um, all of those kinds of things, disability even. Um, you know, what does it mean to say everybody is created equal? Well, who do you, what, what the, the question is, what do you mean by everybody? Do you mean every man? Do you mean men and women? Do you mean every person of every color or religion and, and whatnot? And so this is the, 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 the wonderfully interesting thing about American political culture isn't that we started off perfect and we've been perfecter ever since. The thing that's interesting, that, that the reason I've dedicated my life to looking at American uh, culture and American literature and art and, and history and politics is because it started off with a very intriguing and original idea. And for the last 200 and something years, we've had to ask ourselves, okay, we came up with this theory. How do we implement it and for whom? Right. And so we're always testing the boundaries of that. And it's a painful process sometimes. Sometimes it revol involves civil war um, and difficulty and strife and demonstration. And, and, and uh, sometimes we go too far, maybe. And sometimes we don't extend those blessings of liberty. Who is entitled to the blessings of liberty? And on what basis? To what extent? Alcott's novel is raising that. And it is a fundamentally American issue. So we're going to have our discussion, we're going to have a quiz, I'll, I'll uh, send you an email out about that, and uh, please uh, prepare yourself for, uh, uh, for that. Uh, there is no reading for our next class period, and uh, so there's no homework assignment. We're just going to be talking about assignments and reviewing for the midterm. Thanks a bunch. Have a good weekend.